Jesus is mine. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Amen. Church, say amen again. We are thankful to be in the house of God and even more thankful to be the children of the Most High God of Heaven. Let us together pray to Him. Heavenly Father, we hallow your name, and it is hallowed in all the earth. Father, we come with thanksgiving in our hearts, humbleness in our minds, and thankfulness on our lips as we praise you for all that you've already done because of who you are. Thank you for this privilege that we have now in this portion of our worship. Bless us, Heavenly Father, to listen to your word. As we listen, may we receive your engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. Father, we pray that you would help us. Help us to see in this lesson today as your children that you're calling for us to hold fast and firm until the end. And Father, we know that this is the last dispensation any day, any hour, any minute, and any second, the trumpet will sound. Help us to be prepared. Help us not to allow the things of this life to draw us away from you. Help us to have confidence and faith until we take our last breath. For those among us who have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, May something be said from your inspired word today to prick their hearts that they may come to a knowledge of your truth and be saved. We thank you, Lord. We pray that you would keep us from all distraction, all discouragement, all the schemes of the enemy. For it's in Christ's name we do pray and give thanks. Amen. In Matthew 20, 10, 22, our Lord says, everyone will hate you because of me. But if you remain faithful to the end, if you remain faithful until the end, if you remain faithful until the end, you will be saved. Then the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 10, 35 and 36 says, So do not throw away your courage and your confident trust in the Lord, which is bringing a great reward. You need to persevere and patiently endure so that after you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. 
You see, as children of the Most High God, it is critical that you and I never allow anything in this life to ever cause us to become so seduced, so entangled, or so discouraged to such a point where we begin to lose our love, our trust, and our confidence in the Lord. Which is why I want to call you and your attention uh, this morning to the book of Hebrews chapter 3 where the Hebrew writer is by inspiration of the Holy Spirit uh, is again uh, in this chapter making known the superiority of Christ Jesus. Uh, in this case he makes known the superiority of Christ to Moses. And this is important because of his audience and whom he's speaking to. He's speaking to Jewish Christians, Hebrews had, who had converted to Christianity from Judaism. And they held Moses in high esteem. Amen, somebody. So he's letting them know. And the, the context here, you have to understand why he's writing this letter of Hebrews in the first place. You have these people, these Jewish Christians who were at a point of contemplating leaving Christianity altogether to go back to Judaism. And Judaism was no more. Because Christ is the end, to the end of the law for all that believeth. Is that all right? So we have to understand he's writing to someone who, who's thinking about giving up the faith, just quitting it all together. And he says to them that they really have to understand if they leave what they would be leaving. Amen. And we have to understand that. Notice then verse number one of Hebrews chapter three says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, talking about the Father, who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all of his house, the Father's house. For this one, Christ Jesus, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Is that all right? Your house don't have more honor than you, especially if you built it. Amen, somebody. The one who built the house has more honor than the house itself. Are we getting this? For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house, the father's house, as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ, notice, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Now understand that when he's talking about a house, that's equally uh, interchangeable with family. We talk about the house of God, we're talking about the family of God. Is that all right? So listen, listen, listen to this. But Christ as a son over his own family, whose family we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Now here's the point. Although Moses was faithful in God's house, in God's family, he was faithful as a servant. Are y'all getting this? Christ Jesus is not a servant, but a son. Which means that as a son, he has the same relationship to the house or to the family of the father, which a son and an heir has of the family. Are we getting this? 
Understand this. Moses was a servant, but a servant owns nothing. A servant is heir to nothing. A servant has no authority and no right to control anything. Are we getting this? As the servant himself is entirely at the will of the owner. Amen, somebody. We're servants. We don't own anything. This is God's house. We don't control anything. We don't have no authority than what God already authorized. Is that all right? So watch this. As the son, Christ Jesus is the heir of all. He has all power and all authority. And he is the head of all things which pertain to the house, to the family of God. As the one in whom all things has been entrusted as his very own. Amen, somebody. You say, well, I'm, I'm not getting this. Watch this. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. John 3, 35 says, the father loves the son and has given all, given all things into his hands. Is that all right? So the son, Jesus is a son, so we have to notice verse 6 again. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house or family we are. Is that all right? But notice, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. In other words, we cannot quit. We cannot turn away. We can't rebel. We don't have time to slack off. Hey man, we have to be diligent in following God. And therefore, as an admonition, the Hebrew writer, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he admonishes them and exhorts them, and he uses, now he uses an example, and a bad example of that, of God's house or family, their fathers, these Jewish Christians, their fathers, he's going to try and admonish them and exhort them from an example of their own fathers in the past. Is that all right? He's going to use the example of Israel in the day of temptation in the wilderness. But you and I may ask, how in the world does he go from talking about the super superiority of Christ over Moses to Moses and then go straight to an example of the wilderness wanderings. Because when you look in the text, there's no transition. All right? And this is important, and you may think I'm strange, but I'm pointing this out because this is important. All right? It's critical for us to understand this and why he's going from Christ as being superior and then straight to this example in the wilderness because, watch this, he's trying to get the saints, these Jewish Christians, to realize that the people of Israel, the family of God, who were under Moses in the wilderness, watch this, had been brought out of Egypt for the distinct purpose of going to the promised land. Are y'all getting that? They were brought out of Egypt bondage for the distinct purpose of going to the promised land. But watch this. But they did not make it. They did not make it. God delivered them out of bondage for the distinct purpose of taking them to the promised land, but they did not make it. And we need to understand why they didn't make it. And the Hebrew writer is trying to get these saints, these Jewish Christians to understand why they didn't make it. They didn't make it because they were unfaithful. 
So the analogy that the Hebrew writer is trying to make with the fathers, the Israel, who were delivered from bondage, is this. He's trying to get them to understand Jesus has brought you out of the bondage of sin for the distinct purpose of bringing your soul to salvation. And now you're in the church, you're in the family of God, the house of God. But just because you are in the church, the family of God, the house of God, doesn't mean that you're automatically going to make it. Just because you and I are in the church, God has brought us out of sin. The bondage of sin, God has brought us out. Why? For the distinct purpose of saving our souls. We're in his family. Just because we're members in the family doesn't automatically mean that we're gonna make it to heaven. Is that all right? You see, just because Israel, God's people then, were under Moses, didn't mean that they automatically made it into the promised land. And likewise, just because you and I are God's people now, the church of Christ, does not mean that we automatically will make it into heaven, which is our promised land. Watch this. Look at verse 7. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, is that what your Bible says? says. Notice he didn't say, as the Holy Spirit said. Did y'all get that? He, he's making sure this is present tense because even though he's quoting from Psalm 95, 7 through 11, amen, and to them at that time, that was over a thousand years ago, amen, he's letting them know that the Holy Spirit is still saying this today. And guess what? We're looking at it over 3,000 years later and the Holy Spirit is still saying this today. Watch this. He says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, amen, he says, do not harden your heart. So let me go back. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, today, did you see that? Today refers to time in relation to now, presently, as you have time and are able. Today, if you will hear his voice, if you will hear his word, do not what? Do not harden your heart as in the what? Provocation or rebellion. This means provoking contention and strife in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me tried me and saw my works 40 years. In other words, though they were contending with God, though they were trying God, though they were testing God for 40 years, God still loved them and still guided them. He was still trying to be merciful and patient and long-suffering for 40 years. We can't deal with people for four minutes. Watch this. You see, tested means to tempt and thoroughly put to the test. Now, we might do that with each other, but imagine doing that to God. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray. Notice, they always go astray where? In their heart. Watch this. This means they were not just simply mistaken. Sometimes we just make mistakes. But this doesn't mean that. This, they were not just mistaken. They were wrong in their hearts and their mind. In other words, their heart and mind was not in favor of doing God's will, and therefore they didn't. Deuteronomy 9, 24 says it like this. God said to them, you have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. He goes on to say back in Hebrews 3, and they have not known my ways. They did know, but they didn't apply it. Moses taught them. Amen. They heard what God said. They had been taught. But the point was, they didn't agree with it. 
They didn't want to receive it. Is that all right? So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Is that all right? In other words, God is saying, I'm not going to save you merely because I delivered you out of Egyptian bondage. And in our case as Christians, Holy Spirit is still saying to us, I am not going to save you merely because I delivered you out of the bondage of sin. You are going to have to stay faithful, not provoke me, not test me, not try me, but be faithful. And not just when you obey the gospel, not just halfway in your life, we have to be faithful to the end. Does that mean we don't mess up, Brother Parker? We all mess up. We all came to God because we all mess. We don't have it together. You say, I've been in church 20 years. You still don't have it together. You don't know me. I know you ain't got it together. Notice then the Hebrew writer turns his attention to them. He speaks directly to them in their current situation. And he's now, starting with verse 12, he's now going to exhort four ways. Four ways in which they and we can help prevent falling away, departing from God. In other words, apostatizing. All right. The first way is pay attention to your faith. That's simple enough, isn't it? Pay attention to your or my or our faith. Pay attention to our faith. Notice verse 12. Take heed, brethren. Is that what he says? The admonition is, and the, the, the real word is, watch out. Look out. In other words, he's, he's telling them to see something. And he says, notice he says, brethren, Christians, there would be no way that they could fall away if they hadn't first been members of God's house and family. And I'm saying this because you have some in the religious world who try to teach that these people were not yet Christians because they promote and teach a once saved, always saved doctrine. So they can't agree with this, that a Christian can fall away, but God is making it clear that a Christian can fall away. Yes, indeed. Watch this. He says, watch out, be aware, amen. We have to be vigilant. We read the New Testament epistle after epistle after epistle and we see again, again, and over and over again, be vigilant, be watchful, watch out, pay attention. We have to pay attention to our lives because I'm here to tell you, sometimes sin just creeps up on you and before you know it, you don't even know what happened. And it, it doesn't have to be sin. It can be just the weights of this world. And before you, you, you are out of place, you, you don't know how you got there. Amen. And now that you're there, now the devil going to play on you. Oh, you shouldn't go back there. You, you ain't been there in the first. God, the devil is always playing with our minds to make us ashamed. He says, take heed, brethren. Why? Continue in verse 12. He says, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now, I'm going to say something now that might offend some of you. He says, lest there be in any of you and what? Evil heart of unbelief or evil unbelieving heart. Sometimes we look at people and we say, they're good people. They're just not Christians. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? They're good people. They're just not Christians. 
However, the truth of the matter is, and I know that this is not politically correct, but the truth of the matter is, they are not good people. They're evil, and they're evil because they're not believers. And this is what the passage is truly teaching us when you exegete it. That when a person has an unbelieving part, an unbelieving heart, uh, that person in God's sight is evil. Are y'all getting this? I know this is tough. When a person has an unbelieving heart, they're evil in the sight of God. Why? Because all of their sins are still on them. So you and I can be good in the sight of all men. But until our sins are forgiven by God and we're covered by Christ's blood, we're not good in his sight. We have to understand the only way that we are good is because we have Christ's good blood on us. We're righteous because he's righteous. Amen, somebody. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Watch this. You have some good moral people good moral people but until they have their sins forgiven by God they're not right in his sight is that alright we have to understand that God doesn't look at skin color he doesn't look at our cultures how much we make when he looks at us as his creation, all he sees is red and not red. He said, what are you talking about red and not red? Those who have the blood and those who don't have the blood. While we're sitting up here worrying about who, who's white and black and yellow and purple and all these other things. Evil heart. Watch this. Even when we were God's enemies, Romans 5.10. Don't you know that before you and I obeyed the gospel, we were enemies of God? Amen, somebody. Even when we were God's enemies, he made peace with us because his son died for us. Is that all right? This was before we obeyed. Even before we obeyed, even while we were enemies, God made peace with us. Y'all ain't getting this. Yet something even greater than friendship is ours. Now that we are at now that now that we are at peace with God, because what? We have obeyed the gospel, we will be saved by the life of his son. Remember, it said first. When we were God's enemies, he made peace with us. Then it says, now that we are at peace with God. Y'all ain't getting that. Watch this. God has made peace or reconciliation with all men in the world. You say, how? Because Christ Jesus died. So even though we have many unbelievers in the world, God has already made peace with them. Before they even come to a knowledge of the truth. He's already made peace with them. So you see, God has made peace with all men through the death of his son. But the problem is, all men have not made peace with God. Through obedience in the resurrection. Faith and obedience to the resurrection of his son, the gospel. So God has made peace with all men. But now he's waiting for all men to make peace with him. Are we getting this? So we see, when we have an evil heart of unbelief, it will cause us, even as a member of the house and family of God, 
it would cause us to fall away, depart from the living God. Is that all right? The point in this again, an apostasy again is a, a leaving, a departure from one's previous standing. We looked at that last week. Here, it specifically speaks to the Christian who falls away from the one true faith, one true religion, and the one true church and family of God, which Jesus Christ is the head of. So the point is, Christians can fall away and be lost. Is that all right? So therefore, the Hebrews writer's admonition is this. Listen, in view of those who in their wilderness did not make it to the promised land, you need to watch out. You need to pay attention. You need to be on guard. Look out, watch out, pay attention to your own faith. As you go through the wilderness of your life in this world today, lest you also be found to have an unbelieving heart. An unbelieving heart truly is, stems from a lack of faith and confidence in God. Many times we wander and drift from God because we truly don't have confidence that God will do as he said. Can we tell the truth? Many of us are not walking by faith. We're walking by sight. God, I don't see it. It don't look like that to me. I know what you said, but I'm, I'm looking at it. You ever talk to a Christian? Watch this. You ever talk to a Christian and you're encouraging them in a word and they say, yeah, but we're talking about reality. Yeah, but we're talking about reality. I have to do a double take because I say to them, you don't know what reality is. And we've all been there. I know what God said, but man, I don't see this. Forgive them? What, you, do you know what they did to me? Turn the other cheek? <laughs> I wish I would. Listen, we have to pay attention. The first way to help prevent apostasy and falling away is pay attention to our faith. The second way, and I have to hurry up, the second way in which we can prevent apostasy is found in verse 13. Verse 13 says, but exhort one another, but exhort one another. The first way is pay attention to our faith. The second way is encourage and admonish one another. You see, this is one of the most important but often neglected duties and responsibilities of us as Christians to encourage one another. It literally means, and I'm gonna give you a word picture, it literally means to call another alongside and talk with them. So in other words, they're weak, you call them alongside, you hold them up and you walk with them to encourage them until they're able to walk and then they're able to help somebody else. We need to do that to one another. Is that all right? He says, encourage, notice, one another. The idea here is, watch this, that the encouragement is to be mutual. Mutual. Not just one-sided. Not just one person encouraging the rest. Not just somebody encouraging you all the time. Let me say that one more time. Not just somebody encouraging you all the time. I got my own amens. Amen. You see, we're always on it when someone doesn't encourage us. 
but who have we encouraged? You see, and then he says, how often? He says daily. Meaning, constantly. Is that all right? It really speaks to one who has a selfless mind. Christ had a selfless mind. Christ always looked as, in his humanity I'm speaking, as a man. He always lived, looked to lift somebody else up. He always looked to encourage and exhort somebody else. And we have to have that mind. That's what it speaks about in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Speaking to having the mind of Christ, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. That's going to be the first tough thing to do. Consider your brothers and sisters more important than yourself. That's the mind of Christ. Then it says, care about them as much as you care about yourselves. Do we have eyes that see and ears that hear? In other words, when we come together, are you actively looking to see if anyone's hurting? If Shamari doesn't look like himself this week, I need to have the love and compassion to say, hey, man, what's going on? You all right? Anything I can do? And mean it when I say it. Because if he say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm struggling right now, man. I'm going through. Oh, oh, oh good. yeah, me too, man. I'm. Are we getting this? Encourage one another. Why? Why? Because if you don't know, it's difficult to live a Christian life. Amen, somebody. It is difficult to live a Christian life. I said it. Nothing easy about it. But watch this. As difficult as it is to live a Christian life, it's even more difficult to live it alone without any support from your brothers and sisters. You see, we need to encourage one another. So we need to pay attention to our faith. We need to encourage one another. And then the third way, and this is the final way, because we're going to look at number four tonight, all right? The third way in which we can help prevent falling away is found in the manner in which we are to encourage one another. Okay, so again, he says in verse number 13, but exhort one another how often? David. David. But then he says, while it is called today, this is the third way, the manner in which we are to encourage one another. He says, while it is called today, in other words, now. Not later. Now. Oh, I'm going to call Shamari sometime this week. Now. All right? The idea is our encouragement to one another is not to be intermittent. It is to be your my daily business to admonish and exhort one another in order to help one another in this Christian life. Because as Christians, each and every day, we are subject and liable to going astray. You can look at someone and think they don't need no encouragement. They got it all together. Encourage them. 
because they're susceptible just like you to go on astray. When you a preacher, you a teacher, you this uh, encourage. It's difficult to live a Christian life. Encourage. Even if you think they don't need no encouragement, encourage them anyway. See, oftentimes in the church we may see a brother or sister getting weak, and we notice it. We notice it. And they get weaker and weaker. Next time you know, next thing you know, you don't see them in class or in worship service. Then a few weeks go by, a few months go by. But then if someone is kind enough, if a servant is kind enough to go and visit them and go and check on them to encourage them and ask, what happened? But then it's way too late. It's way too late when he says, while it is called today, he's saying it should have happened today when you first observed it. When you first saw that I wasn't myself. You see, the point is our encouragement to one another must be done in a timely fashion. And why is this so critical that we do it in a timely fashion? Because again, he says, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Why? Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You and I know. You and I know. If we drift away a little bit, it gets easier and easier. You get hardened and hardened, and you try to justify. Then you may get irritated. Brother Halo calls you, and I just didn't like the way he, his tone. I'll find anything to get upset because I've drifted away, and I'm getting harder and harder. Are y'all getting this? Lest any of you. Meaning, it can happen to any of you. Y'all may come in here and say, well, Brother Parker, Brother Parker gone. It can happen. See, we must truly come to realize that though we try to live a Christian life, it's possible for us to be deceived by sin. Amen, somebody. You ever did something and say, I can't believe I did that. I thought I was stronger than that. I thought I loved the Lord more than that. And God is trying to tell you, you ain't as strong as you think you are. You're beginning to think more highly of yourself than you ought to, thinking you know everything just because you can quote a couple of scriptures. And God has to allow you to go through some things so you can bump your head, amen, and get back and, and take his hand. See, we're walking through life, and sometimes we think we can just let God's hand go. You know how sometimes when your kids, when they get too big, and they think they're too big to hold your hand while you're walking in public? No, we can't afford to walk in public without holding our daddy's hand. And I'm to the point now where I just don't, I don't want to hold his hand. I want him to carry me. You said, that's a lot of carrying. Listen, he got the whole world on nothing. Amen, somebody. I want him to carry me. Carry me. Because sometimes when you're walking, you can still slip. Because you don't see nothing. But when he's carrying you, and that's when those are the times when we are at our weakest. Where we're like Paul. Lord, remove this thorn from me. And he says, my grace is sufficient. That's when he's carrying us. When you are to the point where you say, I just can't take no more. I can't do this no more. That's when God can say, well, you ready? Let's go. 
which is where we should have been the whole way long. Put me down. I want to walk on my own. Listen, as I close, watch this. Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 17 through 20 says, and this, in, this is in response to how sin deceives us. And it, when it deceives us, it makes us less sensitive to the word. It makes us more calloused. Is that all right? When you have a callus on your hand or you have a callus on your feet and you can touch it with your finger but you don't really feel it because it's not sensitive to touch, sometimes we can get out of the way in the deceitfulness of sin and we become less sensitive to the word. So now when we hear the word because the sin, the deceitfulness of sin is deceiving us. Now when we hear the word, it don't really prick me like it used to. Is that all right? Ephesians 4, 17 through 20 says it like this. With, all, with the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as Gentiles, as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because, watch this, they have closed their minds and harden their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. When you look out in the world today, there is no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly, eagerly means with anticipation, practice every kind of impurity. And he's talking to Christians. He's saying, this is what some of y'all are doing. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. You see, we need all the encouragement today, now, from our brothers and sisters that we can get. Because the truth is, at times, you're able to see me better than I'm able to see myself. You can see things in me that I may not want to see. Y'all ain't get that. You can see me behaving in a way that I'm just deceived to. I, I, I don't have no, I don't know how I act like that. I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I'm this way. But sometimes you can see in me, I can see in you better than what you can see or what I can see. You see, in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, Paul says, but when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face. For he, for what he did was very wrong. Peter, full of the Holy Ghost, what was he doing? When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, all the Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy, and even Barnabas was led astray by his hypocrisy. So Paul sees it, and he opposes them to his face. And there's nowhere in the text where Peter said, you can't tell me nothing. <laughs> Later on, when Peter is writing his letter, he's talking about Paul and his writings and how faithful he was. Amen. So we can't, listen, if we encourage one another, understand that's not always going to be great things to say. We're adults. We're men and women. So if I'm behaving in a way that's contrary to God's will, you should have enough love and compassion to come to me and love to say, we got to talk. Amen. You see, sin is not sometimes, but sin is always 
deceitful. Watch this. It always promises more than what it actually performs. It always assures us of pleasure, which it never imparts. It always leads us beyond any of the troubles and consequences we ever suppose when we first begin to engage in it. Y'all ain't get that one. Sometimes sin is so tantalizing, but when it's so deceitful that it takes us beyond where we thought we could ever go. Y'all ain't getting it. Sin has gotten us some consequences that we're still reaping today. When we indulge in it, it leads us from one step to another until our heart becomes entirely hardened. You see, we have to understand the person who commits sin is under a delusion. You remember Genesis 3.13? When, or actually before 3.13, when the woman saw it was good for food. She saw all those things that it was good for, right? That it was good for. That it was good for. Y'all ain't getting that. That it was good for. Then in verse 13, then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me. She replied, that's why I ate. So you can see how sin can look so good, but be so deceiving. And the last thing is, sin not only deceives, but it also hardens. This word harden means to become inflexible or dry it out. Spiritually, it speaks to the one who because of the deceitfulness of sin becomes stubborn, completely stubborn, resisting what God says is right. You see, the word itself actually refers to the fact that the more we practice and associate with sin, the more hardened against God we will become. Look with me in Ephesians 5 as we close. Ephesians 5, starting with verse number 1. Ephesians 5, starting with verse number 1. If you have it, say amen. Word of God says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be deceived by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey. Don't participate in the things these people do 
For you were once full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is disgusting and shameful even to talk about what the, the things the, that the ungodly people do in secret. Amen, somebody? So verses 15 through 18 says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this filling is a constant filling that never becomes empty. Pay attention to your faith. Encourage one another. And when you encourage one another, do it now. I've said enough. Hold fast. Holding fast, holding fast and firm to the end. There are any among us today who have not obeyed the gospel, you can come having heard the word of God. Do you believe it? If you believe it, are you willing to repent of your sins, confess the glorious name of Jesus Christ before men, and then in obedience be buried in baptism for the remission and forgiveness of your sin. You can do that today. Tomorrow is not promised. and Yesterday is already gone. Amen. For those of us who have obeyed the gospel, let us remember, let us remember that we must hold firm, fast and firm until the end. Let us not be distracted by the things of this life. Let's pay attention to our faith. Let's encourage one another. And when we encourage, let's do it now.